Well, everyone, everybody, welcome. This is the start of the webinar. I did want to mention that we are recording this presentation, as we did have some folks who wanted to participate but unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, Please note that you are at the presentation on why is Sagebrush Country on Fire, which is a presentation being um, put on by Michelle Christ. Today's presentation, she'll be discussing wildfire trends in Sagebrush Country, um, talk about who the culprits are, um, the impacts, and break down the challenges and opportunities that we have today in front of us. My name is Dolly Edmonds, and I'm the Policy and Outreach Director for Audubon Rockies, a regional office of National Audubon Society. My co-host today is Hannah Nickenow. Hello, I'm Hannah Nickenow. I am the Sagebrush Communications Specialist for the Intermountain West Joint Venture. This webinar is presented as part of Sage West, which is focused on advancing communications and encouraging outreach activities that support collaborative conservation efforts happening across the Sagebrush ecosystem. This presentation is part of our collective work to elevate awareness and action on invasive annual grasses and fire in Sagebrush rangelands. If you want to know more about Sage West, you can visit partnersinthesage.com forward slash Sage West. Dolly and I will be behind the scenes here helping to manage the chat box and facilitating the question and answer period at the end. Please note that everyone but Michelle, Dolly, and I have been muted. To ask a question, please type it in the chat box located at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, move your mouse to the bottom of your screen, wiggle it around, and it should appear. Thank you. So um, again, it is a great pleasure that Hannah and I are able to have Michelle Christ here with us today. And thank you for the great interest um, in attendance for this presentation. Michelle is a landscape ecologist based in Boise, Idaho. She works with the Bureau of Land Management, Fire and Aviation at the National Interagency Fire Center or NIFC. In this position, she focuses on spatial analyses, simulation modeling, and applied research in wildlife fire, wildland fire management to achieve conservation goals. We're excited to have Michelle present today, given her breadth of experience in both the field as well as developing some big picture planning and modeling to guide our management, especially as it relates to fire. She spent 18 years developing research projects ranging from field data collection and monitoring studies to landscape level analyses to develop large scale prioritization strategies. At the NIFC, Michelle works with a wide range of federal and state agencies, many of which are on the call today in developing science-based land management goals and objectives, helps with land management policy and planning processes, and assesses the impacts of existing or proposed land management on ecological resources and wildlife habitats. In her spare time, which I'm not sure she has a lot of, she enjoys being with her family, bird watching, botanizing in her garden, and biking. Michelle, thank you for joining us, and let's pass it on to you. Thank you very much, Dolly, and thank you, Hannah, and thank you, everyone, for attending this presentation today. Uh, so in this presentation, Why is Sagebrush Country on Fire? I'm just going to start with a brief context of fire management history, discuss current wildfire trends in troubling grassland ecosystems due to the large-scale spread of invasive non-native annual grasses, and lastly, highlight the challenges, opportunities, and tools for wildland fire management and the conservation of sagebrush ecosystems. So historically, we have had a century of wildfire management, mainly focused on fire suppression on forested lands. That began in 1910, soon after the US Forest Service was established in 1905. National fire policy was a product of the big blow up of 1910, which was a series of forest fires that burned over 5 million acres across Montana, Idaho, and Washington. And this event triggered full fire suppression to protect timber resources and rural communities. So for decades, oh, this, I'm sorry, this national fire policy um, for decades, and then starting in the 1990s to present, um, all our federal fire management agencies were really trying to strike a balance uh, between fire suppression to protect communities and bringing back the ecological role of fire. And then in the 2000s, the development of the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Strategy was a push to work collaboratively among all stakeholders and across all landscapes 
using best science to make meaningful progress towards three goals, resilient landscapes, fire adapted communities, and a safe and effective wildfire response. And throughout this time period, all the other land management agencies really followed the Forest Service's lead on fire policy. So these charts here depict recent wildfire trends. Uh, nationally, acres bur burned shown in the chart at the top and fire suppression costs, which is in the chart at the bottom, have increased roughly five times just from 1985 to 2017. And while state and federal agencies pay the bulk of the fire suppression costs, these costs only comprise 9% of total wildfire costs. Um, total annualized costs actually range from about 71 to $348 billion. And this is due to loss of infrastructure, loss of private property, construction costs, emergency evacuation, loss of ecosystem services, and also post-fire recovery efforts. And while the public is most familiar uh, with fire in our forested areas, in just two decades, wildfire trends have changed significantly, where shrublands grasslands are now burning as much as forests. So the chart at the bottom shows that from 2000 to 2018, 47% of wildfires on federal lands occurred in shrubland grassland communities. And the chart at the top shows that 56% of fires were occurring in shrubland grassland systems across all of our land ownerships nationwide. So we're actually having more fire in our shrubland grassland systems than we are in our forested systems. And this map here um, shows historic fire perimeters that have occurred across the Western US over the past two decades. So the different sagebrush communities are shown in green. The dark red are fires that have burned in sagebrush dominated landscapes. And the orange represents fires that have burned in other vegetation types, primarily forested areas, but also other desert ecosystems and chaparral. So just over the past 19 years, over 15 million acres of, of sagebrush lands have burned, primarily in the Great Basin portions of Nevada, Oregon, and Idaho. We've seen an increase in annual area burned and also larger fire sizes in other regions. And just over the past five years, approximately 9 million acres of greater sage-grouse habitat have burned, and 80% of that area was within the Great Basin. We're now seeing large fire sizes ranging from 100,000 to over 400,000 acres. And we've seen an increase in fire spread and extreme fire behavior. So for example, in 2018, and this picture here at the bottom was the Martin fire, uh, which occurred in Nevada and it was started by fireworks. And it burned approximately 450,000 acres in four to five days. So wildfire trends have changed over time for these sagebrush ecosystems. So historically, uh, fire cycles were highly variable uh, across the sagebrush biome, where fire return intervals could vary from several decades in our colder, moisture, higher elevations to hundreds of years in the hotter, drier, lower elevations. And these types of regimes had a strong influence on sagebrush landscape structure, and they helped to create these expansive areas that were dominated by dense sagebrush. Whereas today, the contemporary fire cycles have substantially changed from these historic trends. Um, fire cycles in the hotter, drier, lower elevations are now much shorter, and they don't allow time for full recovery. And this is really due to this interaction with annual invasive grasses. We are now seeing bee burns occur on average every seven to 15 years. There's been an increase in area burned and large fire sizes. Whereas in fire cycles in these colder, moisture, higher elevations, we've actually seen a shift towards smaller and less frequent fires. And this is really due to successful fire suppression efforts, as well as other human activities, um, such as past overgrazing that reduced the continuity of, of fuels and um, just development. 
uh, that has fragmented the landscape in these areas. So the reason that fire is now a major threat for sagebrush lands is primarily due to the increasing dominance of the invasive grass fire cycle, especially in the warmer and drier sagebrush ecosystems that are less resistant to annual grass invasions and less resilient after disturbance. So these non-native fire prone grasses invade sagebrush ecosystems like here in this picture in the little red circle and they dry out earlier before the fire season and these grasses provide this contiguous fine fields that ignite easily increasing fire occurrence and spread then after fire cheatgrass rapidly recovers out competing natives while native species like sagebrush just don't recover and eventually just disappear across the landscape and so the result is high rates of conversion of sagebrush to non-native annual grasslands that continue to spread across these landscapes, promoting frequent fire in a positive feedback loop. So over the past two decades, warmer temperatures and weather patterns have been conducive to a substantial increase of Bromus tectorum, also known as cheatgrass across the Western US. And the figure on the left here, oops, sorry about that. The figure on the left was developed by Jones et al in 2019. And it depicts how the distribution and cover of annual invasive grasses have increased um, just between the years of 1990 and 2018. This spread in interaction with fire has created these large expanses of monocultures of cheatgrass. And cheatgrass is now expanding into higher elevations and further east. Um, so for example, into Wyoming, as well as into Yellowstone National Park. And if it continues unabated, it will likely change fire regimes in these areas as well in the future. So the figure on the right represents the change in the proportion of shrubland and grassland over just a hundred year period. So the picture on the top was taken in 1901 and it's really what we see in sort of these old western movies. And the picture in the middle was taken in the same spot in 2008. And this is just a great example of the ecotype conversion to invasive grasses occurring across the Great Basin. And then the graph at the bottom shows proportion of shrubland versus grassland over the past 12,000 years and how much that proportion has changed uh, just since European settlement. And so the graphics shown here are used just to illustrate that the Great Basin is one of the largest areas with the highest fire probability across the United States. Um, this map in the background uh, depicts large fire probability across the western U.S. And in this figure, high probability is shown in sort of the brownish reddish colors, while yellow represents sort of your more moderate fire burn probability, and the green is your lower um, burn probability. And the high fire probabilities in this Great Basin area that is um, highlighted here in the red box correlate really well with the occurrence of these invasive annual grasses. There are also other well-known non-native annual invasive grasses that cause the same or very similar invasive grass fire cycle that we see with cheatgrass in sagebrush. And they also are resulting in a very similar ecotype state conversions for warm desert and forested ecosystems across the West. So these grasses can include bentonata, which is invaded northwestern sagebrush and ponderosa pine forests, medusa head, which is really invaded sagebrush and other ecosystems throughout the West, uh, red brome, which is invaded our southwestern ecosystems as well as sagebrush ecosystems. Buffalo grass, which has invaded our southwest warm desert ecosystems, and South African layman lovegrass, which has invaded the southwest warm deep 
desert ecosystems as well. And there are, are many impacts of these altered fire regimes, um, especially for sagebrush. So they, the impacts include an increased risk to human life and property, high fire management costs, and loss of cultural and economic resources. In addition, many wildlife population declines um, are occurring right now just due to sagebrush loss and fragmentation due to this uncharacteristic fire cycle. So there are a number of wildland fire management challenges um, that we are dealing with currently. Um, the first is an increasing duration and severity of fire seasons. Uh, we are also seeing a decrease in fi the firefighting workforce. There is a reduced resilience of the landscape overall, and we're seeing increases in development in the wildland urban interface. And we also have federal fire funding challenges, um, where a lot of our funding really is largely focused on uh, forest fires. So this table below is just a comparison of wildland fire budgets for two federal agencies, the BLM and the Forest Service. Um, and this table is not really apples to apples comparison because of the different programs within agencies. However, it highlights that there is an imbalance in funding largely due just to the Forest Service's historical role in addressing the nation's wildfire issues. So while BLM manages more acreage and over the last five years has had more acreage burn on average, BLM budgets are substantially lower in comparison to the Forest Service for all programs. There are additional challenges as well. And one big challenge that we have is that we have a culture that's really focused in on forest fires. Our current policies are focused on forest fuel reductions and they really don't address the large percentage of fires that are occurring in our shrubland grassland communities, especially on Department of Interior lands. You know, so for example, there's the Healthy Forest Restoration Act the Forest and Landscape Restoration Act in 2009 omnibus. Um, the omnibus 2018, which provided additional tools to the Forest Service for forest resiliency, and even the Farm Bill in 2019, which really promotes forest resilience and active forest management. And in addition, the public's understanding of fire is that past fire suppression has resulted in the fires that they see today. And they are not aware of other causes of uncharacteristic fires and unaware of issues with invasives and fires. Um, we also have challenges with how the media um, portrays fire. Uh, the media tends to emphasize fire on forested lands and the surrounding communities. And it's more of this reactive coverage of fire rather than a combination of proactive education combined with that reactive coverage. And so right now we've been working on some different media workshops in this regard, just to bring more information um, to the press when they are covering these fires. And lastly, research in fire has mainly focused on forested lands. And so here we really need to increase research and attention on troubling grassland communities. You know, for the Forest Service, they have the specific wildfire research arm for forests and fires. On the Department of Interior, we do really have more of a limited fire research budget. And there's some research gaps that would really be helpful for us um, in addressing this uncharacteristic fire cycle. And we have challenges with human-caused fires. So just depending on the region, human-caused fire ignitions range from 31 to 97% of fire starts. Uh, the most common causes of human ignitions include power lines, vehicles, target shooting, campfires, and also fireworks. And so, in order to help address a lot of these challenges, there are quite a few opportunities um, that we have for reducing these wildfire and invasive cycles. 
Uh, first, we really do need more integration between state and federal invasives programs and wildfire management programs. And here, we need to increase the coordination for targeted prevention, control, and eradication of invasive annual grasses, test strategically placed field treatments and invasive fields reduction strategies, use new management strategies that are based on ecosystem resilience to fire and resistance to invasives, um, and really use our coordinated role fire protection areas and expand these areas to help increase our firefighting capacity in remote areas. And just overall, just kind of elevate the issue of non-native invasive annual grasses and wildfire. We also need a stronger collaboration between state and federal wildfire prevention programs for reducing human-caused fires. So more focus on education and prevention programs in areas that are prone to human-caused fires and also have high fire frequencies. So currently, there are a number of collaborative efforts and tools that are being developed to help address this invasive non-native annual grass and wildfire cycle. Um, and this is occurring at multiple scales, the national scale, the regional scale, and also the local scale. And so these tools and efforts at the national scale um, include the science framework, um, part one and part two. And this framework just provides um, it provides a framework for using the concepts of ecosystem resilience to disturbance and resistance to invasives to prioritize conservation and management actions across the sagebrush biome. There's also the Western Weed Action Plan, which is a blueprint of actions to address invasive plants in the sagebrush biome. Um, and this is based on uh, funding opportunities, policy and regulation, coordination and collaboration, and also research and monitoring. And there's the Western Governors Association that has a new invasive subcommittee that is currently creating a landscape scale strategy to address invasives and fire across all the Western states. And the Department of Interior's National Invasive Species Council is leading a collaborative effort between invasive species experts and wildland fire managers in identifying what is needed in policy and programs to help elevate this issue in wildfire management. And at the regional level, um, NRCS has developed a spatial prioritization for managing invasive annual grasses for southwestern Idaho. And there's been a lot of research and um, decision support tools that have come out for prioritization for post-fire recovery efforts, as well as restoration efforts and also currently investigating fuel break placements across the um, sagebrush biome, primarily in the Great Basin area. And then at the local level, there are cooperative weed management areas that are collaboratives that manage invasives across a designated area within the states. There's a state's invasives management programs and again, there's more research information coming out for effective post-fire seeding and also cheatgrass control. So here's um, just an example of um, the science framework, part one and part two, and how this is used at a very broad scale. Um, it basically uses a fire risk assessment to help distinguish between sagebrush communities that are at risk to fire and assesses their capacity to recover from fire and resist annual grass invasions. And so here we can use this type of information to spatially target areas for wildfire management and then determine the most appropriate types of wildfire management actions for suppression operations, fire prevention strategies, vegetation and fuels management, and also post-fire recovery. And so, for example, um, in this figure on the left, in this fire risk assessment, these areas here that are in kind of more of the brownish, um, these areas in the map uh, represent our intact sagebrush communities. But these communities have a high fire probability 
and also a low to moderate resilience and resistance. So these areas really should be a high priority for protection from fire. And so in management really could focus on the strategic placement of fuel reduction projects around these habitats for protection, um, use community outreach and fire prevention and mitigation efforts to help reduce human caused fires, um, use post-fire rehabilitation, and also monitor um, for the spread of invasives into these areas. So in wildfire suppression efforts at the national scale, our highest priority is to protect communities. And we can also use fire risk assessments, um, such as this one, to help inform the prioritization of response to multiple fire ignitions that are occurring at once across the US for areas that are at high risk of loss to fire. Uh, for suppression tactics that are more on the ground in sagebrush country, um, we can use these heavily degraded sites for pre-positioning fire suppression resources and also just kind of use some different and innovative fire suppression tactics. Um, for example, extinguishing fire edges and hot spots within the burn perimeter, uh, retaining unburned, sa unburned sagebrush islands within burn perimeters, and where it's safe, uh, construct direct rather than indirect fire lines. And so field management strategies here can really help protect our intact and vulnerable sagebrush communities from loss to this invasive grass and wildfire cycle. And here, these um, field management strategies um, can be placed strategically, um, and they can include invasive reduction projects that can help disrupt continuity of these invasive grass fields, as well as we can strategically place fuel breaks for fire suppression efforts. And in these management strategies, there are some different trade-offs that we have to consider. Uh, first, there's limited research on this fuel invasives reduction and fuel break effectiveness and their impacts on these native ecosystems. And um, these, they could function as a potential vector for spread of planted non-natives and invasives. And there really needs to be this commitment to funding the long-term maintenance of these fuel breaks as well as these invasive reduction projects. And we also have some opportunities for increased effectiveness in post-fire rehabilitation efforts. And so these efforts could really focus on creating this resilience to fire and resistance to invasive grasses. And you know, we could do this by prioritizing native seeding strategies um, based on provisional seed zones. Um, we could target a lot of our rehabilitation efforts between sagebrush patch refugia within these burned areas and establish patches of diverse native forbs, bunch grasses, and other shrubs to mimic natural recovery succession of sagebrush communities after fires. And just overall, in managing for these non-native invasive annual grasses um, across sagebrush lands, um, the goal here should really be to reduce the occurrence and spread of invasives and uncharacteristic fire. And so these invasion state thresholds shown in the table here are from Mueller et al. in 2013. And they are just really helpful for, deter for determining under what invasion state the use of prevention, eradication, restoration, and containment strategy, strategy should be applied. And it's also applicable for other invasive species. So in these very low to mild invasion states shown with the green, the blue, and the yellow, um, these are the areas where management strategies should really focus on preventing new invasions. And we can do this by ma maintaining our native communities, identifying those plant communities that are most at risk, uh, really make a commitment to prevention and also use early detection and rapid response. 
you know, while these other states, the more moderate and infestations and also the cheatgrass dominated areas, here we can help to reduce existing invasions. And we can do this just through coordinated partnerships, um, identifying the highest priority need and also use strategic place-based restoration and just really commit to this consistent long-term effort in this regard. So there are a few efforts currently underway um, in developing a landscape and regional scale mapping to determine where different types of invasive management strategies should be applied. And in these mapping efforts, the following information um, really should be incorporated. So this figure at the top left here depicts the cost of impact in managing invasives when using prevention, eradication, control, and long-term management. And here, control, highlighted in orange, the control of invasives is more effective and it's more cost efficient when it's done early uh, using more of this proactive strategy before these infestations become widespread and when this man and when management then switches to more of this reactive strategy where success is more difficult and it's also more costly in addition the figures in red and blue below show that the landscape context of the invaded areas matter for management. So for example, control is more effective over the long term when strategies are informed by what's going on in the surrounding landscape. So the figure in blue, just right here, shows that invaded areas that are surrounded by low invasion whereas this figure in red depicts low invasion areas that are surrounded by highly invaded areas. And so in the instance of um, an occurrence uh, such that we see in the blue figure, we'll have much more success in helping to control or eradicate or prevent new invasions. And so all of this type of information um, combined with maps of invasive percent cover and the threats that spread invasives can be used to create spatial management zones to determine where prevention, eradication, and control could be applied. And so this map here is an example of a zoned landscape where different invasive management strategies could be applied based on lower or higher invasion levels. And so in the green and yellow areas, we can use a proactive management strategy based on prevention, eradication, suppression, and restoration. And these would really be the most cost effective and likely have high rates of success in reducing the spread of invasives and the extent of wildfire. In areas that are orange to red, management strategies could focus on fuels reduction through control measures containment, and post-fire rehabilitation. In addition, prioritizing fire prevention in areas that have high fire frequencies would help reduce the spread of invasives in these particular areas. So in, invasive plant management should really be integrated and prioritized with all land management activities that we do. Um, and this would include land uses, you know, such as mining or oil and gas drilling, vegetation management, grazing, and also climate adaptation strategies. And so I'm not going to read through this entire table. Um, I just wanted to highlight it here because it shows different invasive management strategies that could be applied based on the three different invasion states here on the left, and then just your land management type. And this figure here is just a great example of a spatial prioritization at the regional level. Um, this is the NRCS's Idaho Cheatgrass Challenge Strategy. And it identified three broad regions for implementation of a strategic plan to tackle, tackle annual grasses uh, for Southwest Idaho. 
or even just all of Southern Idaho. And here the goal is to identify and defend core areas that are still these intact sagebrush ecosystems that haven't been invaded yet. And the goal is to defend these large core areas from annual grass conversion and that these core areas should really become the top management priority. And here, um, to use early and aggressive control of annual grass invasions and promote perennial grass uh, to maintain and help build the resilience of these core areas through time. And then second, while these core areas are being defended, uh, there's an opportunity to expand these core areas by restoring the transition zone that are shown in sort of this yellow and orangish, right, kind of across here. So these are the core areas, kind of the green and the yellow. And then this right here is um, in the dashed lines are sort of these transition zones. And here, a really a sustained and multifaceted effort is needed, um, including a large scale restoration in these areas just to help halt and reverse the regional spread of this annual grass conversion. And then third is to really mitigate impacts of, this, of these annual grass regions, which are shown in the dark red and kind of also in these orange areas. Um, and here, um, primary actions in this region really include asset protection, fine fields reduction and re rehabilitation and maintenance of these perennial grasses just to help mitigate the severe impacts of this cheatgrass fire cycle. Then at the local level, um, there are the cooperative weed management areas. And these CWMAs are local stakeholder driven collaborative uh, groups that um, really focus in on invasive species management. And these entities have local knowledge, um, they're able to deliver, and they also have a lot of buy in. And so really, you know, here we can work with these CWMAs to help them focus um, on identifying and eradicating small populations of non-native invasive species, um, help with the post-fire seeding, um, especially with native species, uh, monitor non-native species responses to wildfire and prescribed fire, uh, share knowledge about non-native species and fire in specific ecosystems, and consider impacts of other disturbances and management activities in addition to fire on non-native species. And so just to help to promote um, these CWMAs, um, we really need to make a long-term commitment uh, to support this cooperation through policy and partnerships with our uh, federal and state partners, um, develop comprehensive plans, to address the management or prevention of invasive species within designated boundaries and provide more facilitation and coordination across jurisdictional boundaries uh, for consistency in managing these invasive species. And then lastly, there really has been much more integration between research and invasive and wildland fire management. Uh, so USGS, the Forest Service Research Stations, and university researchers uh, really continue to work with managers in developing a wide variety of tools and systems um, that can be applied, uh, you know, for effective management practices, strategic fuel reduction, restoration and post-fire rehabilitation, and we're also in the process of developing new fuel models for non-native annual grasses. Um, we're also studying the control of annual invasive grasses through the combined use of herbicides, soil bacteria, native seedings, and targeted grazing. And they are available to help answer questions on the capacity of native plant communities to be resistant to these invasions under a variety of environmental and management factors. And so just in summary, you know, wildfire and invasives management is a very broad and very complex. Um, however, currently there really is a strong need and there's many opportunities to focus on 
invasives reduction in our management strategies in order to reduce this grass fire cycle, especially where fire um, is burning uncharacteristically. And so with that, I just want to say thank you very much for listening. And um, we can now just open it up if there's any questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I know um, folks, as, as I am sitting here, has a, there was a lot of information shared. Um, so you have given us a lot to think about. This is a tough challenge that this ecosystem is facing um, and that's really impacting a lot of folks. Uh, and we have gotten such uh, great questions. Um, and Hannah and I have been diligently uh, following the chat box and we're gonna get to as many questions as we can today. Um, so again, keep them coming in. Um, Hannah, would you like to start off with asking one of the first questions? Yes. So taking into account where we are today with invasive annual grasses across the country um, and alongside all the collaborative efforts that are taking place around the West, just give us a diagnosis. How are we doing, Michelle? <laughs> I would say that um, we are at the start of it all. Um, we are definitely making some small efforts and we've had a lot of um, small successes in certain areas. And right now we're just in the process of really building upon those successes and building up those collaborations where we can be much more effective at a, at a larger scale. Thank you. Um, Michelle, we have a question that asks, um, a few years ago, um, genetic manipulation of cheatgrass showed a lot of promise. Um, as of yet, a, is there a cure-all for eradicating cheatgrass? Um, I am not aware of any cure-all for eradicating cheatgrass. I sure wish there was a cure for it. Um, but uh, as of right now, I, I'm not aware of any. And, um, but I do know that research is still in the works. And you know, now they're currently focusing on um, using a combined effort of many different um, whether it be genetic variation combined with targeted grazing combined with you know herbicides to be able to help reduce um, the cheatgrass that's out there so that might show more success yeah so one of the next questions was what you, you pretty much answered it there but i'm going to see if you have anything to add to it but it was what control methods have proved most effective but specifically the question was about bentonata um, does spraying itself work long term or what are some of the, the tips for that invasive specifically? You know, I am not an expert at Ventanata, um, but Becky Kearns at the U.S. Forest Service Research Station, she has been studying Ventanata and she, um, she has a website up uh, and um, you can really provide, it provides a lot of information on Ventanata. And I think right now though, um, yeah, they're, they're still in the process of trying to figure that out. And I will note um, that as, because we are recording this presentation, we're gonna share it with everybody. Um, and we also do have some resources that we can add just because I know we've, there's been a lot of good discussion here today. Um, another question that has popped up is, um, feral horses, um, wondering if there's ever been an overlay that has been done that looks at horse population maps with cheatgrass. Um, the, the participant was especially interested in the area of Nevada, Oregon, Idaho, and Wyoming. You know, there has not been yet. And um, really that is due to, they're just recently, these products have come out where you can overlay these invasive grasses, you know, with um, these wild horse population levels and make that determination in terms of what's occurring there. Um, so that opportunity definitely exists, um, but to my knowledge, it hasn't been done yet. On the list of human caused fires that you provided there, um, are there any that are identified as the most frequent that maybe people when they're out in the field can be most diligent to, or are they all just kind of kind of equal in that list that you provided? 
Um, some occur more in certain regions than others. So really the one human cause, you know, um, the ones that cause human fires the most vary depending on the region that you are in. You know, I, I've seen a, in California where it's the target shooting is the most or it's the fireworks, you know, whereas other areas it's power lines. So it just really depends regionally. Okay, and um, there is a question here, Michelle, that um, if I want to stay informed about wildfires in my state or really any Western state, who's the most appropriate entity to reach out to? Is it a state or federal agency and any guidance on that? Um, you know, it could be both a state and federal agency. Uh, you can look at the website at NIPSI and we have some information there for the fires that are occurring. Um, and maps of where they are occurring and if they're active or, or if they have been um, suppressed and or contained. And then there's also at the state level, um, there's a, a state, I think our state forest programs are the ones that really work with uh, wildfire management. And so reaching out to those entities, um, they should have some information as well. So this question um, has been asked in a couple different ways. So I'm trying to trying to pull them together and it's, it's kind of a tricky one. And if you just would prefer to point people to other resources after the call, we, we can go there as well. But um, okay. it's about um, cheatgrass and pinion juniper. So how can we highlight the need and get action for fuel reduction of things like cheatgrass in invaded areas alongside the fuel reduction of things like Pinion juniper. So it, it, I'm assuming that the question is about how can we make those equal? Is that it? Or is it when we do these pinion juniper treatments, how to keep invasives out of them? Um, there, there's a lot of information and context there. Um, but I would say that the science framework part one and part two is actually a great resource in, in that regard in terms of managing for invasives and then managing for pinion juniper and, and what can occur there. And, you know, that currently, you know, we are sort of elevating this issue of um, in this invasive in wildfire cycle. And so, you know, we are starting to address more in, and do more invasive treatments as field treatments. Michelle, we have another question. Um, it's easy to be overwhelmed by the scale of the problem as yeah. we all sit in our living rooms. Um, do you have a specific example of what gives you hope? What gives me hope? Oh gosh, that's an open-ended question. Um, what a lot, what gives me hope is when I am hiking, you know, kind of out in this sagebrush country. And even though some of these areas that I'm hiking in um, they, t they do tend to have a lot of invasives. I see the native plants and, and native grasses that are still present. And over time, I've actually seen them sort of increase. And so that gives me some hope. So looking across our borders, um, have you and your peers been collaborating with agencies in Canada, namely the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan? No, you know, actually, that's a really good question. Um, to my knowledge, I, I don't believe we have, but uh, that would be um, something definitely to look at and, uh, and see what can be done there in terms of coordination. Yeah. You're on mute, Dolly. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Um, we had a question um, that referenced uh, the introduction where I shared that you are a birder. <laughs> and the question comes up, um, asks, um, are you able to help us understand how the changes in wildfire cycles is impacting wildlife such as birds? You know, there's definitely a lot of research going on in that regard in terms of the loss of habitat 
um, especially bird habitat uh, due to these invasive grass fire cycles. Um, I know USGS has really been focused in on that. Uh, you know, sage grouse is, is definitely the highlight for sure, but there are many other bird species um, and that have lost habitat and are in population declines uh, just due to the loss of sagebrush, especially in the Great Basin. So looking at uh, another type of recreation, there is a question about um, hunting or and uh, those that do recreational shooting. Um, and it, they were asking about, uh, is there work being done with hunters and shooters to change shooting practices, um, such as advocating for use of controlled places like ranges? Um, and I know BLM on uh, public lands thinks a lot about that. That might not be your area of work specifically, but are, is there kind of any, any specific work being done there? Um, yeah, there, there definitely is. And I, I would say that ranges from, you know, office to office, whether that be the BLM office, whether that be a state office, whether that be a forest service office. Um, but they are, um, you know, helping to kind of create those ranges, those um, um, shooting ranges where people can go and practice in a safe place that won't start these fires. Um, still at the same time, there are people that, you know, they just like to go out and, and practice target shooting and not necessarily at a specific range. Um, so there is a lot more education um, that is needed, but is also getting out there um, in that regard. Um, we have another question, and they are coming in fast and furious, folks. So thank you all for a really wide range of questions, and um, and Michelle for for handling all this. Um, we have a question on sagebrush associated wildfires and how you reference that they are really kind of focused on the Great Basin, mm -hmm. um, and not only for cheatgrass, but other, but also these other invasive species. Have you are they how, what are how are they doing on the eastern? portion of the sagebrush range, um, thinking the question refers specifically to Wyoming. Um, do you think wildfires will become more common in the eastern portion of the range through time? And what can be done if that's the case to um, minimize that? Um, I, I would say that right now we have a great opportunity in areas like Wyoming or Montana, um, where we are seeing cheatgrass and some of these other invasive annual grasses expand into um, to be able to do prevention and, and start eradicating where these populations are popping up, you know, really get on top of it right now. And that would help abate, um, you know, and, and put a halt uh, to that potential change in these systems and, and also fire cycles. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely that opportunity exists right now. It, it is expanding and um, right now is, is the opportune time to, to take care of it. And, and before we jump to the next question, I will interject and note that um, we do have real leadership shown in some of the states by some of the governor's offices and so on um, for invasive species work groups um, trying to get ahead of the curve. So, uh, and there is one in, in Wyoming specifically. Hannah, do you want to address the next one? Yeah, so uh, kind of, we know you come from uh, the BLM, but uh, what about private lands? Are there resources available for fuels reduction on things like cheatgrass on private lands? That's a really good question. And I believe that there are some resources available, but I don't know that information offhand. So that would be something that we could look more into and, and help share um, that information. Great, we'll add that to our list of follow-up resources. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a question here um, talking about one of the species most connected with the sagebrush ecosystem, and that is pronghorn antelope, wondering um, how they are impacted by cheatgrass and other invasive species. Yeah, I, I am, I don't know exactly offhand, um, but I definitely imagine that they are impacted just in terms of the, the grasses, the, the foraging opportunities. Um, so I, I don't believe that cheatgrass is probably as nutritious for them as the native grasses, um, especially these native bunch grasses. 
Um, but there, again, I think we could provide some more resources to help answer that, those questions. Okay, so we have what I think might be our last question. Um, uh, and I'm going to tailor this a little bit be, uh, to Sage West because, you know, this is a Sagebrush Communications Network. And so, you know, Sagebrush Country has a fairly low human presence. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how we can continue to get the information out about this alarming trend of increasing wildfire in Sagebrush Country due to invasive species to more people? You know, I really think that whether it's the states, federal agencies, you know, maybe these um, CWMA, these collaborative efforts of just reaching out into those communities and through some of these existing collaborative partnerships that we do have and being able to get that information out and share it with them. So um, whether that's at the city level and also the county level and, um, and just where any of those opportunities really exist. But yeah, I, I, it's a really, um, it's challenging, um, but it's definitely, you know, something that would make a difference out there. Great. Well, it is the top of the hour um, and recognize everyone has some busy schedules. Wanted to again, thank you, Michelle. I know you put a lot of work in pulling this presentation together um, and, and helping inform us, um, the participants, range um, everyone from a lay person to professionals that are working in this field. So thank you for giving us all something to think about. Um, we will be posting this recording on uh, Sage West landing page, which is partnersinthesage.com forward slash Sage West. So everyone that registered, you will be getting a link to this recording as well as um, we'll get you more information on Sage West. So you can go to that page and find out about some of the resources that Michelle has referenced. Um, again, what a great presentation and thank you everybody for really good questions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get through all of them, but thank you so much for um, all that you are all doing for the Sagebrush ecosystem, especially Mich uh, you, Michelle. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thank you very much. This was great. Okay.